Okay, good afternoon. I do hope that you could have the interaction with me just to enrich the sessions rather than only being pa pa passive and uh, just listen without, you know, critically analyze what sort of information that I'm going to give you in short. So I have a, a bit of disclosure because I have some royalty through the books that could be related to the topic on the use of the antibiotics. And if you see the patients like this in the photo, if you remember this patient come from the patient that was reported this morning, then you may consider that the wound just took place several hours before you managed to do the repair of the wound and also cleanse some other part with that excoriations. You may consider on whether you would provide the patients with antibiotics or not. And if you see the chronic wound like this, it's basically a stump at the femoral region. And you see all the wound covered with granulations tissue and some part with slough. If you consider the dimension, it's quite huge. And if you consider that, you know, it's going to be port the entry for infections, then you may criticize yourself whether you do really need skin graft. And if you consider this granulating wound on the surface, started from the beginning with terrible situations, terrible condition with some of the uh, important structures exposed, and also with unhealthy look because of the infections, because of the slough, and so on. And moving on on some other examples like this, this is about you know newly case, I mean a new case with burn injury involving the thigh and also the external genitalia, and you see catheter insert it in then you may also criticize yourself whether you start from the very beginning the antibiotics. So this discussion is going to be about rational use of antibiotics. But then I limit the examples in the plastic surgery practice, although the concept or the philosophy of the rational use applies for all disciplines in medicine. So let's start with wound. I mean, because we are plastic surgeons, then we may consider skin as the target organ or tissue that is going to be good for us to be an example of our discussions. So in terms of wound, then people may see all, wound, all wounds prone to potential infections. But I have to tell you, but I have to tell you that not all wounds are always infected. And if you see chronic wounds, chronic wounds is by definition with time, uh, time frame should be existing already, should have been existing for at least three weeks. So then it may come up into more weeks to go and months to go. Then all those weeks and months the wound always prone to infections. But once it is not infected, do you think that you would need antibiotics to manage the wound? So technically and basically, if you see the microbiology of the wounds, I now bring you into an understanding of chronic wounds. By definition, you understand what chronic wound is comes into stages before it is really infected. So mostly chronic wounds are contaminated. The term with contaminated relates to contaminations by bacteria. Of course, there are also terminology with contaminations by debris. But relates to infections, we need to take bacteria or microbes into account. So 
anytime wounds has bacteria or microbes on its surface or on the tissue in the wound, it's called contaminated. Otherwise, you may see that the wound is sterile. Before the wound get infected, those bacteria on the surface of the wound or in the tissue needs to be colonizing. The life of their colony needs to be bigger and greater so that they reach significant number of armies to fight and to destroy the tissue until they manage to destroy tissue and it comes into a status of infection. So the chronic wounds, although they are contaminated, it does not necessarily to be infected. And many chronic wounds in your hands, wounds that are properly managed are not colonized because the colonization is worse than contaminations. Speaking about the, accident, the existence of microbes in the tissue or on the surface of the wound. So before infections, there is also a term that is called critically colonizations, critically colonized wound. That is the beginning of infections before it is really infected. So with that understanding, I hope you agree with me that chronic wound is always contaminated because you cannot take chronic wounds into a sterile wound. You cleanse the wound, you deal with the wound, but only in the several minutes or some hours or days when you keep the dressing, on the wound, then bacteria comes, right? But that contamination is not infections because contamination is only the very early stage of the existence of bacteria in the wound, in the tissue, before it becomes infected. So with the term of colonizations, colonized wound, the normal floras grow but then, even though the number of the normal floras increases, but there is no clinical sign and symptom of infection. The wounds just look the same with the previous days, previous weeks, meaning that when you consider the sign and symptom of infections, should be with as signs and symptoms of infections. Until you see tissue destruction, which is a clinical sign of the very dangerous situations called infections, then you may agree with your assessment, your observation that a wound, a particular wound is called infected because the bacteria growing faster or fast then in the states of colonizations, then the bacteria reach into certain number with other factors, including also virulence. If you call virus, then the power of virus to destroy tissue, it's called virulence. And with the bacteria, that number reaching a certain level, which in you know, in the reference, you may see some expert may call 100,000, but mostly people would agree that a million of bacteria would start to cause infection. The infections comes with clinical signs and symptoms, and those clinical signs and symptoms is no other, are no other than the sign of tissue destructions. So infections is about tissue destruction, destruction, and that tissue destructive and, and sorry, tissue destructions would prevent the wound to heal. So we need to manage that infections treated with the antimicrobes that would include also antibiotics.
to stop the tissue destructions and allow or facilitate the wounds to heal. So the cutoff point of infections is when you come into findings microbiologically that the colony forming unit is a million per gram tissue or a million per milliliter fluid. So you may base on your examinations, I mean on your tissue samples, but you need to convert it into gram tissue or you may take fluid from the wound and convert it into milliliters to be able, milliliter to be able to have this a million colony forming unit. Then microbiologically, you may take the wound labeled as infection or infected. By time, those normal flora that comes beyond that 10 six of colony forming unit per gram tissue or per milliliter fluid from the wound will be substituted by the existence of anaerobic bacteria by time. Once again, by time. When you do not treat the infections at the very early stage, then the bacteria will be creating party with more friends they are not only the normal flora, but also with the anaerobic bacteria. Then time goes on, the party becomes worse because those party goers invite more microbes and it becomes polymicrobes, not a single type of microbes or bacteria, but then they are multi type of bacteria with that polymicrobes. So infection itself depends not only the number that we have just discussed, the load of bacteria, which comes with that cut off point, but some bacteria may not necessarily to be that 10 six of colony forming unit per gram tissue or per milliliter fluid. As an example, how or when you diagnose a tissue suffer from tuberculosis. You only need to detect one single bacteria of tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, just one bacteria, then you confirm it that the tissue suffer from tuberculosis. But with the other most and more common bacteria, then you need to consider that colony forming unit to be more than a million. The other factors that depend, sorry, uh, define the status of infections is by the potential of destructions of the bacteria. This is also called as virulence. So those produce hyaluronidase and also toxin would be more potential to cause infection than other type of bacteria. And of course, the host resistance takes roles in defending the body, the tissue to fight with those enemy to fail or to win the game or temporary game so that they keep the tissue away from infections. So infected wound in a real meaning would be a barrier to wound healing. So we need to treat infections. So let's move to just recall what we have known about signs of local infections. An example of chronic wounds to become infected, then you may see the difference from the previous timing, the previous time, the previous time period. An example of this is the amount of exudates becomes more excessive. There is sign of inflammation such as rubor, redness, warm, pain, swelling, which was previously not existed. So locally, a wound could be assessed to be infected if the patient suffer from pain more than the previous one, than the previous you know, time frame. The peri wound skin is reddened 
And if you palpate, the periwoon skin is warm. The periwoon or limb looks swollen. Periwoon skin is indurated or macerated, which did not exist before. And the uh, accidents become purulent, yellow, green, gray, whatever. Then it comes also with malodor. Systemically, that infections become worse and influence the systemic conditions of the patients. Patient may suffer from fever, malaise, increase of what white blood count, white blood cell count, more in severe conditions. So then to suspect infections, most of the local and systemic signs and symptoms need to be pre present, need to be present. But there is also assessment that you may have with locally infection, locally infected, local infections without necessarily with systemic signs and symptoms, signs and, and, and yeah, signs and symptoms of infections. An example with this, reddened periwoon skin and fever alone may be a sign of inflammations rather than infections. So we need to be critically assess the patient as a whole, whether this, you know, reddened periwoon skin would fit into the criteria of, of infections. I'll show you examples later on. So when you deal with the wound and you manage to give your assessment with infections, that is the timing for you to give antimicrobial therapy. The, the antimicrobial therapy may not always be systemic treatment or therapy, but also you may use antimicrobes locally. And if you consider antimicrobes locally, you do not need to consider antibiotics unless you see that the antibiotics is not used systemically. For example, what's inside the uh, nebacetin? Someone would, may help me. No one? An example, the content of nebacetin. It's a brand. I forget the name of the uh, active antibiotics inside. It's, it's neomycin. Neomycin. Sulfate. neomycin. Is it? Neomycin sulfate, doctor. Right, thank you. For example, with neomycin sulfate, you don't use that kind of drug systemically. So then you can use that antibiotics for local treatment. But remember, there are many other antimicrobes to be used locally rather than on the antibiotics. Now let's move into antibiotics. The antibiotics is considered as systemic antibiotics now in this term. So there are only two corridors of prescribing, providing, and giving antibiotics to your patients, prophylactics or therapeutics. With prophylactic antibiotics is defined as administrations of antibiotics, antibiotics prior to performing procedures, surgery, to help decrease the risk of post-operative infections. You are not putting a zero risk of infections by providing the patients prophylactic antibiotics, but this is to decrease the risk of post-operative or post-procedural infections. And this also reducing the absolute risk of wound infections by over 80% compared to if you do not give your patients with antibiotics. So with that number, you know, percentage which is high, then prophylactic antibiotics becomes important to be given to patients. What about therapeutic antibiotics? It's an administration of antibiotics to treat infections, meaning that you need to have your patients assessed or diagnosed with infections. If the patient is not labeled as infected, 
you do not need to give patients therapeutic antibiotics. Then how do you explain empiric antibiotics? I would like to invite any volunteer. What is your understanding about empiric antibiotics? Volunteer, please. Empiric antibiotic is used when there is no definitive culture of the battery of the wound. All right, good. Meaning that Gadia gave us understanding when she is talking about therapeutic antibiotics. Is that correct, Gadia? Uh, no, um, yeah, empiric is um, broad spectrum when we don't have the, yeah, yeah, therapeutic when we give therapy to the patient. Right, because you mentioned that you are based the definitive antibiotics on culture. Meaning that you are taking tissue samples or fluid or whatever to send, to send the samples to the microbiology to get the culture and also the resistance tests. Then it would give you information about the correct antibiotics that is sensitive to the bacteria comes from your culture, right? Now the question comes whether you have the term of empiric antibiotics with your prophylaxis. Okay, let me go back into my slides. That's gonna be your homework to consider what sort of anti empiric antibiotics? So basically, empiric antibiotics is for initial treatment before the microbiological results come to you. It's guided by clinical presentations. So then you may consider site of infections and most likely organism. An example of this is particular surgery, let's say breast implant or you know, GI tract surgery, then experts know that most likely the organism that may cause infections is this particular organism, maybe one, two. With that understanding, you may guide yourself in choosing the antibiotics before the definitive antibiotics comes to you to guide you to change the antibiotics, which is more proper to treat the infections. So it's also based on prior knowledge about what sort of microbes that usually comes into the infections of this you know, particular tissue or particular procedures. And you may also rely on the local antibiograms of your clinics or of your hospital. The epidemiological data that you have, that the hospital has, then you are based on that common antibiotics that is mostly used because of those, the data, usually in six months. A unit, a health service would change the information with an updated information about these antibiograms. Then when you use that empiric antibiotics, people usually use broad spectrum antibiotics. And with some particular concern, they may combine it, you may also combine it. But if you are very sure about site of infections, most likely organism, prior knowledge, and also the data in your unit, then you may come with narrow spectrum of antibiotics rather than always rely on the principle of broad spectrum. So what is the main idea of prophylactic antibiotics then? This prophylactic antibiotics is used when you actually insert artificial implant in your patients. Implanted foreign bodies, bone grafting procedures or any grafting procedure, large dissections. So before surgery, if you see yourself going to dissect tissue in a large area, and this point may give you justifications to start or to give your patients with prophylactic antibiotics. The long duration of your surgery, of your procedures, high amount of anticipated blood loss, 
calculated blood loss, or when you deal with contaminated procedures or dirty procedures, you do not need to provide and prophylactic antibiotics without those factors if you deal with clean procedures, clean surgery, and also with clean contaminated surgery. But this is to be a, you may consider to give the patients prophylactic antibiotics with clean contaminated surgery. But let me give you an example why I'm not strict that, you know, clean contaminated surgery should be always be with prophylactic antibiotics. In more than a decade, I've been doing cleft lip and palate. What do you see when a surgeon deals with cleft lip and palate? This is not about clean surgery. This is about clean contaminated surgery. But I do not provide my patient with prophylactic antibiotics. Then how would you give prophylactic antibiotics then? So we have come into a discussions on the type of antibiotics, but then you may also need to consider the dose, one gram, two grams, and also the route, whether you consider always IV injections or in other procedures you may consider because the procedure may be considered as minor enough, then you may provide the antibiotics orally. And when is also a good question for you to consider. Usually in the OR, that is the benchmark for you to practice. 30 minutes or an hour. The common practice is an hour before the surgery with the reasons why that an hour is the timing for you to give prophylactic antibiotics. Besides those factors, you also need to take it into a very serious account. How long would you give your patients with prophylactic antibiotics? Whether it is going to be one shot or you can repeat your antibiotics and for how long? That's very important. The general, universally acceptable, practice of prophylactic antibiotic is no more than 24 hours. Then what is the main idea of the therapeutic antibiotics? How would you give the therapeutic antibiotics? There are cases, conditions that you may give therapeutic antibiotics orally, but also there are many that you may consider to give your patients parenterally. The same steps of questioning yourself apply when you deal with therapeutic antibiotics. The type, the dose, the route, when to start right after your diagnosis, right? And also for how long? And how would you stop the antibiotics in the corridor of therapeutic antibiotics? So being able to answer for how long, do you have the parameters to guide you? Now, again, I would like to invite volunteers. Any of you, please? I think I would invite all those who, has, who have not turned on the camera, the camera, to turn on the camera. Any volunteer, please? Okay, you are reluctant to respond. It's up to you. So you need to have the parameters to guide you for how long you would give your patients with your therapeutic antibiotic, antibiotics, right? Otherwise, you know, when you don't know when to stop, then you are actually not a good doctor. There are common misuse with it use of antibiotics. The empiric antibiotics without clear evidence of infection. This is quite common. I've been seeing it for long, long years that people are neglecting their own concern, their proper knowledge, the existing knowledge. 
that people abusively use empiric antibiotics without evidence of infections. The antibiotics to treat positive culture in the absence of clinical infections is also, some of you may have joined me in the uh, multidisciplinary discussions, discussing about, or meeting, discussing about difficult to treat patients. Then we see our counterpart in other, you know, disciplines, just treat the treatment, sorry, the patients just based on the culture. We got the positive culture here. We need to give the patients antibiotics. In fact, you are in the front line, see that your patient does not have clinical infections. That's also a common misuse. Prolonged prophylactic antibiotics, as I've mentioned, it's quite common you, you know, take lessons from your seniors, from your consultants, you know, we still have trained in. So let's keep the antibiotics as long as the drain is still in. When you look into evidence, you know, there are not a single strong evidence to prolong the prophylactic antibiotics just because of drain still in. So common practice universally, universally is accepted that prophylactic antibiotics is no longer than 24 hours. Failure to follow the microbiological results. You know, there are doctors that have taken samples, tissue or fluid, exudate, send it to microbiology and start giving the uh, empiric antibiotics. Then the, clinically, the patient gets better. Then when the microbiological results come, then they don't change the antibiotics because clinically it's there, it's better. You know, patient gets better, not only by the antibiotics, that particular conditions may also because of the uh, very good immune system. But then the bacteria was not killed by that empiric antibiotics. So may relapse or may worsen in the next time period if the patient was not lucky. Excessive use of certain antibiotics because of in the past, because of the uh, you know, sponsor driven, because you gain gratifications, you were you know, well treated by the company, then you misuse, you direct yourself with that treatment. And there are also some other conditions, situations where people were driven into you know, excessive use of antibiotics. Now you see, this is a laceration in the tongue. Would anyone understand that when you deal with repair of this wound, you are dealing with what sort of procedures in terms of the existence of bacteria, potential existence of bacteria? In what corridor, in what classifications you are dealing with? Are you dealing with pneumonia because multiple choice questions? Are you dealing with clean procedure? Any volunteer, please respond. Because it's intraorally, doc, so it might be contaminated or. So it never, it is never be, sorry, it is never clean procedures because it is intraorally. Is that true, Gadia? Uh, yeah, doc, because it's yes. GI tract. Yes, because there are, you know, bacteria and intraoral is one of the, uh, the the source of bacteria that comes with the highest number of course the eye tract i mean the rectum colon is also the counterpart then Mark, the question is whether you would give antibiotics dealing with that case let me invite aron abdullah Doctor. Yes, Hello. what do you respond? Hello. What do you respond? Okay, Aaron didn't listen to the discussions. What about Florence Lowe? Yeah. 
Yes, Dr. Victoria. Hello? Hello? Okay. Let's move to Norina. Yes, sir. Yes, what do you respond? Um, from the uh, because if it's if it's uh, contaminated, I listen, think. That listen, the problem is very simple. It's a lacerations, fresh wound, in the tongue, and considered that the tongue is intraoral, and intraoral is full of bacteria. So it is never labeled as clean procedures when you repair the wound. At the least, it is clean contaminated and even contaminated because of bacteria, which is high in number inside the mouth. Now the question is, would you give the patients antibiotics? Yes. Yes. Okay. In what corridor would you give the patient? If we uh, cannot, uh, we are not. If we are not certain that we can um, clean the wound properly, in this case, let me clarify if, if, my question. Let me clarify my questions, Nurina. Let me clarify my questions. If I ask you, if I ask you about the corridor. You only have two corridors, prophylactic or therapeutic. Prophylactic. Prophylactic. Okay, so you may consider the type of antibiotics, the dose, the route, that kit. For how long would you give antibiotics? One dose. One dose. What do you mean one dose? One shot or one dose? Both. One, it's only one prophylactic dose. Okay, one prophylactic dose. How would you give the patients the, that kit systemically, by sorry, parenterally or orally? If it's uh, one dose, it's uh, systemic only one, one time. Okay. You know, you are lucky because the patient is a kid, then you do the procedures under general anesthesia, you get the IV access. Prasojo, you are general surgeon. If only the patient is adult patient, and I have, you know, coached you on how to do the procedures to repair that lacerations in the tongue under local anesthesia. All right, so how would you give Oh, sorry. I come to the previous questions. Would you consider prophylactic antibiotics? Yes, sir. I will. I consider uh, to give the patient uh, prophylactic antibiotics. So, what route? Uh, I still prefer uh, uh, IV. IV. Okay. So meaning that you, know, you put the patients in the IV, you inject through IV yes. before you repair the wound. Now, let me take an example of chief resident. Unfortunately, I only have Gadia with me. Gadia, what about you? Uh, maybe if it's an adult, we can try to give them orally. Orally, when? Not prior to the prior to the stitching. Prior to the stitches. How long? Prior to the stitches? Prior to the repair? Um maybe two to three hours. Because you need longer time by oral. Yes. How long would you give? The IV antibiotics? Mm. 
when was the when is the going to be the timing for you to give the antibiotics, Professor Joe? Thirty minutes to one hour before procedure. Okay. All right. So let me just give you how would you deal with that lacerations? It's very easy. You need to inject the tip of the tongue and then put guide suture so that you can pull the tongue and then you cleanse the tongue and you repair the wound. With that, I'm confident that I can clean the tissue, the wound properly, and I rely on the very good vascularizations on that tongue, then I do not need to give the patients antibiotics at all. Because I deal with cleft palate. Cleft palate is major surgery because of the excessive tissue destruction, sorry, tissue dissections. Massive, I mean not excessive, massive tissue dis dissections and I do not give the patients antibiotics. However, you are still justified to provide antibiotics prophylactically with one single dose. Still, I can understand that. So my practice is away from the common practice. The common practice, you are justified to give that patients prophylactic antibiotics with only single dose, meaning that Never prescribe the patients with antibiotics because the patient is sent home. All right? I would rely also some, you know, gel to be used in the wound of that tongue, like Obat Sariawan, so that I help the wound to heal better without relying on antibiotics. Now I give you the next example. Do you see any sign of infection with this case? This is a case of a kid, you know, suffering from circumcisions with wrong procedures injuring the glands. All right, no systemic sign and symptoms of infection. The pain is just so so because of the circumcision. Now, give me a response. You use reactions there with your thumb if you agree that case was with infection. Use reactions using thumb reactions if you agree that that case is infection. One, two, three. Four. All right. Oh, okay. More. Six. Five. Oh, Gadia Turno. Okay. Six. Six people. I would say, you know, in a real clinical situation that I see these patients, I do not detect any infection. Why? Because you see here some necrotic tissue, the black colored tissue that provide fighting of the normal tissue because of that necrotic tissue. So then the fighting of the tissue comes with hyperemia. And that hyperemia and edema is mixed by the procedure itself, the circumcisions, and by the existence of that necrotic tissue. That redness is not infection. So I'm showing you this just to let you criticize yourself whenever you list the signs and symptoms of infections locally and systemically. You need to combine all those data locally and clinical, so systemically to be able to draw conclusions whether you are dealing with infection. Now what about this? You see that this is about releasing the contracture of those two, uh, sorry, four digits, and you put hardware there. 
the question is whether you need to provide the patient's antibiotics. Volunteer, please. Uh, may I, sir? Yes, please. Uh, I think uh, what, uh, there is no sense of infection in this patient, but we must consider antibiotics uh, because there uh, we put some implants on the fingers so we can see their implants on digity uh, two until five so we must consider uh, antibiotics because there's uh, we consider it uh, as for uh, foreign material got it good respond florence florence you see the reading the word in the slide the wires is kept for three weeks so how long would you give the patients antibiotics Uh, I, in my opinion, we can give it maybe uh, a bit prolonged until uh, so around four weeks. Uh, so we ensure after uh, the wire is released, we can give uh, one more week to prevent any signs of infection after we uh, done the release procedure. But that is my opinion. Okay, thank you. What year are you in now? Um, sorry, sir. What year are you in? Your uh, I'm still on first year, doctor. First year, good. Okay, thank you. Can I invite other opinion? May I, sir? Yes, please. Um, for this patient, uh, still my choice is prophylactic corridor. Meaning that you would Meaning, give uh, I give the antibiotic prior to the surgery, but uh, the antibiotic is only one dose. Good. All right. So, Nurina, you have the correct answer. Florence, if you followed the previous slides from the very beginning, you should throw your concept with that antibiotics prolong if or even for, for weeks. In this case, we need only one single shot, one dose before the procedure, 60 minutes before the procedures, or the closest would be 30 minutes before the incision. That's it. Although the hardwares kept there in those four digits for three weeks. What about this? Oh gosh, what sort of wound it is. Huge wounds. It existed for Gadia for how long? In your predictions, this wound has existed. Gadia? Do we lost Gadia? Ini ketahuan kalian tuh kalau ngikutin sesi ya sudah segala macam dikerjakan ya nggak apa-apa sih kalau memang emas to do kalau nggak emas to do Lebih baik harusnya ikut beneran gitu. Itu dimatiin semua kamera itu yang bikin membuat saya jadi bertanya-tanya ngapain sih itu di balik sana itu. Jadi kalau memang sedang kerja ya silakan. Kalau memang sedang kerja ya saya tinggalkan aja kuliah ini. Buka semua kameranya. Yang kerja tinggalkan ruangan ini. It's okay, no problem. Gadia, did you listen to my? Sorry, uh, it was disconnected. Yeah, for how long in your prediction? Because I remember you are the one who deal with this case as well. Uh, yes, Doc, I predict the wound has been there for uh, three weeks, but before it was, um, she came with, uh, the wound was closed by an escar, and during the uh, perawatan, the Escar is 
uh, has came off and it Okay. <clears throat> now, do you see any sign of infections, Prasojo? No, doctor. Okay, Kadia said no. What about Dwi? Uh, no, sir. Okay, would you give the patient antibiotics? I don't think we... Uh, should give her antibiotics. Do you have any reason for that? Uh, uh, because uh, with the adequate antibiotic and wound dressing, we could uh, we don't have to use the antibiotics. What you need to do is you treat the wound on daily basis or based on rational steps when to change the dressing but basically you keep the wound from you know a chance for the wound to have colonizations if you swap if you take a swab from this wound i'm positive that you're gonna get the bacteria but positive culture doesn't mean justifying your assessment that this huge wound is actually infected. This is just messy wound, but without any sign of infections. So we are surgeon, we deal with this wound, we are in the front line dealing with the wound, do not easily accept what other specialty give you advice on, give the antibiotics, unless they have very strong reason with that. Okay, but just if the antibiotics is targeted only to protect the wound, then you do not need to agree with. You do not need to give antibiotics because you deal with the wound with the main principles of the best solution for pollution is dilution. And also you may apply antimicrobial agent topically, which are not antibiotics. All right, so then with those stimulating slides that I've given you, being able to answer for how long, if you are in your assessment to give antibiotics, then you know the response, you know the concept of prophylactic antibiotics. It is not further from 24 hours. And if it is about Therapeutic antibiotics, you got to know what sort of parameters that will give you guidance to stop your antibiotics treatment. Because I would say, you know, when you do not know the clinical reasons to start your antibiotics, you do not know when to stop with proper clinical reasons. With that, I would stop this uh, sharing and I invite you to any questions. We have two minutes to come for one hour. If you have any questions. So if I have to convert it in Bahasa Indonesia, perhatikan baik-baik bahwa message ini mengharuskan Anda untuk sangat kritis dalam menggunakan antibiotik Contoh, Florence tadi mana? Sudah pergi. Yes, still here. Contoh Florence, bukan hanya Florence, tapi ada ribuan dokter yang masih punya konsep seperti yang dia gunakan tadi. Dan itu harus dibuang jauh-jauh agar Anda tidak berada pada kelompok dokter yang tidak rasional dalam bersikap menggunakan antibiotik. Kalau itu diberikan kepada Anda, empat minggu antibiotik, hepar, penjal Anda, terutama hepar Anda, diajak untuk membawa beban selama empat minggu for nothing. You know. In fact, the concept that we apply with those hardware is only one single dose, even without post-procedural antibiotics. 
just before. And you know the reason of before, ya. Yeah? Demikian pula dengan Anda lihat tadi, di kobitus yang besar begitu itu. Para residen senior bedah plastik tahu itu akan menyelesaikannya dalam berapa pekan, bulan. Nah, selama sekian bulan terbuka, masih luka, bonyok-bonyok begitu, haruskah Anda membebani pasien dengan antibiotik? Tidak sama sekali memerlukan antibiotik selama Anda tidak sampai pada diagnosis infeksi. Selama asesmen Anda tidak tertulis infeksi, never give the patients antibiotics because your antibiotics is not prophylactic. Prophylactic is for pre-procedures or pre-surgery. Tidak ada payung antibiotik selama ada luka, lebih daripada koridor yang benar tentang profilaksis. Gitu. Silakan Nurina. I would like to uh, ask, most of us are really, really, um, well, this is, I think we should try to counter because most of us rely on laboratory parameter to treat or to give um, antibiotic. Is it um, necessary for us to add some laboratory examination uh, when assessing um, infection? Yeah, of course, but you know, you cannot rely on the lab results if you do not see any clinical sign and symptoms. An example, this morning you join the morning sessions, the morning report. Three patients come late after major burn. Five days, the two of them came five days. One of them came six days after burn. You see that? And you do not need to give antibiotics. But if you refer to the lab test, how much would you predict the leukocyte count, the white, the white blood cell count of the, those patients? If you recall the morning sessions, they are all more than 15,000. Would you treat that white blood cell count with antibiotics to decrease? The number of the leukocyte count? No. You see that you need to combine the data resources from clinical and also with the supporting examinations with those lab results. Not results, result. Am I clear enough, Nurina? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. If clinically the patient does not suffer from infection and you took culture because of chronic wound, as I mentioned, chronic wound always contaminated. And when you take tissue sample or sweat, it most likely to reveal with positive culture. But then there is no single signs of infections. But when the result from the microbiology comes to you with positive culture, with some list of resistance and also sensitive antibiotics, would you treat that microbiological data with antibiotics that is burdening the patients? No. One more question, if you still have any of you. All right, so I thank you very much for joining the sessions. Hopefully that it gives you a strong principle when you need to treat your patients with antibiotics, prophylactically or therapeutically. Be correct and most, our main message is be rational. Thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.